team here. So uh, Jeff is a uh, soon-to-be professor at University of Washington. <laughs> and, and Joe is a professor at Berkeley. And together they started a company called Trifacta. There's some exciting work, uh, which I'm guessing you'll tell us about. Yeah. So thank you. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, Joe and I are excited to be tag teaming uh, with a talk, maybe a slightly different focus from, from any of the other talks today. Obviously, a lot of exciting work going on in both the algorithmic and system sides of working with big data. And so we just wanted to hit some notes that focus on what we think is like the third kind of important piece to making that work, which is a focus on the analysts, the, the people, including yourselves, the ones who are actually involved in making sense of data, then going forward, making decisions, and hopefully improving the world. And so to sort of set the stage, I wanted to start with a quote. And of course, quotes always have to be old to have gravitas. So we're going to go back in time to 1962. And this is, of course, the famous statistician John W. Tukey, uh, among other things, the creator of the FFT algorithm and also the one who really spearheaded our modern notions of exploratory data analysis. And he wrote this wonderful article, uh, again, over 50 years ago, which he called The Future of Data Analysis. And it's a fun read, so I encourage you to pick it up. I just wanted to share just a few excerpts in which Tukey, staring at us here over his horn-rimmed glasses, says to us, the last few decades have seen the rise of formal theories of statistics, legitimizing variation by confining it by assumption to random sampling, often assumed to involve tightly specified distributions and restoring the appearance of security by emphasizing narrowly optimized techniques and claiming to make statements with known probabilities of error. Yeah, no rhetoric here. While some of the influences of statistical theory on data analysis have been helpful, others have not. Exposure, the effect of laying open of the data to display the unanticipated, is to us a major portion of data analysis. Formal statistics have given almost no guidance to exposure. Indeed, it is not clear how the informality and flexibility appropriate to the exploratory character of exposure can be fitted into any of the structures of formal statistics so far proposed. It is too much to ask for close and effective guidance for data analysis from any highly formalized structure, either now or in the near future. Data analysis can gain much from formal statistics, but only if the connection is kept adequately loose. So ponder that for a while, and there's some different ways to interpret that. So one is, you know, here's this guy you know, staring you down over his glasses, <laughs> telling you, you know, you know, basically, you know, take that, Carl Pearson. Um, but really, if you think about it, I, you know, the rhetoric, I think, is intended to grab your attention and really highlight the fact that data analysis obviously really often really depends on advanced machinery and algorithms, but also there's a person at the center and a domain expertise. Their ability to work with that data effectively, in many ways the usability Carlos was talking about, is also a critical opponent to analysis. And if we look more broadly over the life cycle of working with data, we see areas where like, the need for both human input and automation really come together. My background is actually in visualization. Joe's is primarily in databases. Uh, but both of us kind of come to this realization as we look over the full process. There's a lot involved in making sense of data and putting big data to work, from acquiring data, cleaning it, integrating it, doing exploratory analysis, building models, verifying those models, uh, communicating results to others. And while it might be, you know, nice if the process worked in this sort of waterfall fashion. We all know from sort of hard-won experience and many hours of tedium that the process is often much more like this. So this raises the question of how do we build the types of tools, systems, algorithms that let us navigate all these different shifts of data models, data representations, in ways that really help people more effectively and more efficiently get to interesting insights. And so that's the theme uh, for our talk. Uh, what I wanted to do is so give some concrete examples from our own research uh, at Stanford, which now have, we're moving our group over to Washington, really on an area that, that Carlos highlighted multiple times in his talk as well, and that's the use of topic models such as latent Dirichlet allocation. So in this case, we'll look at ways in which we can make these more accessible, but we'll perhaps we make better models by thinking about users' needs and how the models respond to analysis tasks. This is actually work done by my now PhD graduated Jason Chuang, along with folks in Chris Manning's group. And what you're seeing on this uh, picture here is actually a visualization um, of decades worth of Stanford PhD theses. In this case, they've been grouped by departments, which are these colored circles. And we wanted to explore the effects of interdisciplinary collaboration or other types of developments on how different academic disciplines become more or less similar over time. 
And so to do that, we actually started off building tons of different models. So here's a sample of just four. And so in each of these, we use a different way of measuring the similarity between collections of text. So one is actually just standard cosine distance among TF-IDF vectors. Others comparing topic vectors from different variants of latent Dirichlet allocation. And we take the resulting similarity matrix that we get from these and then project them into 2D. And you get these different pictures of academia. These blue and green circles are the sciences and engineering grouped together. Purple is the med school, and we see out to the orange of the humanities. But given all of these different models, like which one should we trust? Which one is more effective? Which one better reflects how people think about these problems? Well, it can be hard to say. Um, here they all kind of look the same at this zoomed out view, so maybe we can drill down for more information. And this is by using interactive visualization, we can actually explore, maybe put a single department in the center and then see how the others array around it, basically reducing our view to just a single row or column of the adjacency or similarity matrix. And doing so here, we put English in the center and we notice something funny. So according to our model, all of the humanities clump together and have no difference between them. Now there are interesting statistical regularities in the text used by the humanities, and the model is picking that up. However, we lack the resolution to look at differences that we know exist, and moreover, from my position as an untenured professor, this can be a very politically dangerous graph to show uh, to others at my school. Uh, so what's going on here? So when we say, well, it turns out in this case, we just don't have enough topics. Even though we chose the number of topics by optimizing the perplexity on held out data, you know, this is not a perfect heuristic. So it turns out if you increase the number of topics, you get more breathing room and the humanities, uh, fortunately, do separate as we'd expect. But there's other errors or other questions that arise, and so we found again the need to drill down further. So for example, going from a single department to constituent theses, both within that department and from neighboring departments, to try and make sense of these similarities. And by representing the data in this way, not only did it help us better understand the models we were building, it allowed us to share these models with others in the university, so professors from many different departments, and actually have them annotate things that they thought were effective or perhaps misleading or wrong about what they were seeing in the results of the model. And one of the wonderful things that came out of this engagement with domain experts is that it revealed a fundamental false assumption underlying every model we made which is we had assumed just naturally that we can measure similarity using a distance metric, which by its definition is symmetric, right? Seems natural. Turns out humans have no such compunctions. So I'll give you an example to help make this clearer. The music department at Stanford does really amazing research you know, at the edge of you know, digital music using lots of computational technologies. On the other hand, the computer science department does almost nothing with auditory or musical data. So it's not actually all that strange for people to say music is close to computer science, but computer science is not close to music. And so this actually gave us an insight on how we might build models that are more responsive to our users and the analysis tasks at hand. In this case, what we did was actually use labeled LDA, a supervised variant, given all the labels of the different uh, departments, to learn the word distributions for each department from their constitutive theses. We then can follow that up with a standard unconstrained LDA inference step, which then says how much do different departments borrow words from others. And this actually gives us an asymmetric affinity score, which then much better um, matched the different types of judgments we were getting from domain experts. So this is some of the ways in which different representations and also loosely coupling some anal an analysis tools with other types of models actually allowed us to move forward. It turns out this level of um, almost tedium or like work, lots of iteration and hard work and making these models really be responsive is not unusual. If you look at work from you know, the computational linguistics community, for example, uh, this is a work um, actually using topic models to look at the, the, the wax and wane of different techniques in NLP. They fit a model with 100 topics and then threw away 64 of those topics as being irrelevant and then manually seeded the data with 10 more. How's that for an unsupervised learning algorithm? Similarly, if you look at over 100,000 NIH grants analyzed by Tally and Natal, they fit over 700 topics. We went through many, many iterations of parameter tuning and also adjusting the underlying language model. For example, picking out bigrams, which are better indicators than unigrams, et cetera. So they got a model that, through a, a very intense process of expert val validation, they felt comfortable with. So this raises, I think, some interesting questions. You know, how can we do this better? I mean, current practices are really just look at the top five or top ten words per topic, which while useful also allows us to sort of just project our own knowledge onto the model, perhaps missing other aspects of what the model does and doesn't actually capture. 
So this raises you know, one research question among many, which is how we might better support this form of expert-guided, human-in-the-loop verification. So one way is through perhaps better visualizations. I would love to be able to use GraphLab, as Carlos just showed, and IPython, and pull up a visualization like this, rather than a term list. In this case, we've actually fit an LDA model onto the entire proceedings of the history of the Information Visualization Conference. Um, and now we've shown that the results as a matrix, topics as columns, and individual terms as rows. Applied some novel techniques for both term selection and ordering to both show clustering and preserve reading order as we try and understand what are the contents of these various topics. And different representations can help us make sense of our models more effectively, better verify them. However, there is a scalability challenge as well. I mean, in this case, we're only looking at the results of a single model. How might we scale that up? Interesting questions. Um, just one that I would share with you is that we took an approach where, let's take a step back, and before we look at the algorithms, ask, what does a human-created topic model look like? And maybe can we use that as a way to help evaluate automated results? So we actually ran a survey where we have experts, these are people who've run the InfoViz conference for over a decade, list out the main topics in the field with access to the entire proceedings. So this includes topic labels, all the different keywords, as well as representative documents. And from this, we can actually compile you know, similar probability distributions over words for individual topics, and then use them to try and compare that to the results of algorithms. So for example, what you see here, each row represents a topic that was basically created by people and then across the columns, we see uh, latent topics discovered by LDA. Then through a process of a matching and denoising algorithm, we can say how well does the results of an algorithm match with the results of what people curate. And doing so is one, we can see different types of matches and et cetera, but we can actually start to quantify different diagnostics for how a topic model does or doesn't align with human expectations. So for example, we have out to the right all these things that don't match any expert topics, those are so-called junk. We can see uh, expert topics that aren't resolved by any LDA topics, so that we call those missing, and we can just start to count these up. Similar, we can look at aspects of fused topics, where maybe multiple expert identified topics are combined by the model, and then sort of the, the transpose of that, where a topic you know, may be present but repeated across multiple latent topics. So now we can actually start to count up all of these things, and by doing so, we can now expand beyond just this single model, so we can create these representations to analyze just how one model performs. But then we can start to zoom out and then calculate all these things, missing, junk, repeated, fused, across a number of, in this case, different topics. So now we see how the resolution of topics to human concepts plays out as we change the number of topics in our model. We actually look for places where we get the, the best resolution to human identified ideas. And of course, we can repeat this for the other hyperparameters as well. And as we scale out, we can start to say, what is the performance of all of these different algorithm variants um, given this reference set of expert concepts? And I'll stop there because I think you get the idea. But the takeaway is that with this just one user study, we were able to evaluate over 100,000 different models. And among the way, we found things like great support for existing hyperparameter optimization techniques. They seem to work real well. However, other types of topical quality measures seem to have very little, if any, correlation with what humans actually find. So again, by thinking about how these models are then, you know, um, really respond to the analysis tasks at hand and the way people think about their domains, we get a whole nother dimension on which to consider these really interesting issues in big data. And so with that, I'd like to hand it over uh, to Joe for the second half of the talk. So I think, sure, okay. I think the uh, projector didn't do any kind of justice, I guess, to Jeff's uh, graphs, um, which are both incredibly clear and informative and also quite beautiful. Uh, and unfortunately, you didn't see much, if I'm not mistaken. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm going to unplug briefly. We'll get the slides available to you. Um, and I don't think this is going to fix it, but, uh, which is why I didn't interrupt you on the fly. It's a damn shame to have a talk on visualization without the visuals. <laughs> but it was remarkably interesting nonetheless. All right, um, so I want to step back a little bit. Uh, one of the things that Jeff, uh, uh, that I enjoy about working with Jeff is that both of us um, are academics who also try to stay pretty well grounded in uh, practicalities of what people do when they work with computer systems and work with large amounts of data. And uh, we get to both go really deep in research at the university and then occasionally step back and just say, well, what matters? And 
uh, how do people get their jobs done? And um, the first time I did this was long before I met Jeff. He reminded me recently that he was, I think, in high school or something when I was doing this stuff. But uh, it's good to work with people younger than you. They're energetic. Um, but I, I sort of, when I was finishing graduate school, I went through this. I just spent uh, about three, four years thinking about one thing, and I was getting pretty sick of it. And for those of you who are either uh, students or people who've been spending a long time in a deep technical area, um, a good exercise, and this is what I sort of went through at the end of grad school, is to just ask yourself, what's your chosen field's biggest blind spot? And as you think about it, I think it's useful. I try to sort of stay attached to this guy, sort of the uh, up and coming arrogant kid who doesn't necessarily care about what everybody did before them. So that was me. So, um, you know, you want to go at this with a certain degree of disdain and scorn for your work, your friend's work, all the time that's been spent in the field, and ask yourself, well, you know, what's the blind spot? What's missing? So as I looked at this in 1995, um, it seemed to me that the obvious question in databases was, well, what about those queries that don't come back for a while? So this is the Microsoft query user interface, which was kind of state of the art at that time for uh, visual interaction with data. And when you would run a query uh, against a database that lasted for any amount of time, you'd get this lovely hourglass cursor, which would tell you exactly nothing. And um, I remember being a little boy and going with my mom to the mainframes uh, and typing on punch cards and stuff. And that was pretty much the user interface they had as well, you know, when I was just a little boy. So really, as of the late 90s, even though there was the web and there were all sorts of great things happening, um, the interface to data was still horribly bad, just unbelievably bad. It was the worst possible user interface you can imagine. It was no interface at all. All right, and, and things got a little bit better. So this is the interface from a 90s era OLAP uh, business intelligence tool called uh, Metacube. And they were kind enough to at least warn you that things might take a while and perhaps you'd like to do something else while the job was running and they'd, they'd get back to you. So that was sort of the state of the art. That was pretty cool, asynchrony. Um, and uh, so I started a project which I pursued for about five years at Berkeley called the Control Project. And this is a slide that I presented you know, in, I don't know, maybe 1999, and it's pretty relevant. Uh, so the goal was to do online, not batch processing of very large data sets, to give constant useful feedback for long-running data intensive operations, to give pro progressive refinement of answers as a job ran, and to give the user control online while the job was running so they could change their mind, they could refocus the energy of the computation, they could prioritize the work. And my thought back then was that, golly, you know, this is pretty interesting because it's not just my expertise in data processing, but we're going to have to do some estimation as to where this computation is going, and that's going to come from statistics. And we have to keep in mind something about the user experience. And so, you know, back then the best word I could come up with was just the user interface better be good. So there's got to be some kind of research there. And I went about trying to find collaborators. It took me, you know, 10 years to find Jeff, but trying to find good collaborators to work on these, these problems in other areas. Um, and, you know, this theme is one that uh, was really uh, stayed with me ever since. Um, so the goals that we set for the project at that time were to maximize not performance per se, but what I called the first derivative of the mirth index, which is happiness against time. Uh, and the thing was that this metric of happiness was dynamic. So the user would start the job, they would get some feedback from the system, and they'd go, oh gosh, not really like that, more like this. Right? And so their goals for what uh, a job might need to do might change as they get some feedback. And so it was important for the system to be dynamic not only in what it, it output, but also what it allowed the user to do. Um, and so this is a little simple example. I don't know to what degree you can see this, but it's pretty, pretty uh, black and white. Um, it's just a simple um, sort of group by query. It's asking for the average uh, grades per college at the University of Wisconsin at the time. And uh, there's a couple outliers that you could see after only a few seconds of processing, even though this multi-megabyte file took took a very long time to process back in the day. Um, and uh, these two uh, departments turn out to be, um, I believe, education and air, military, and naval science. Both had very high GPAs at the time. Um, and some of the things we'd allow you to do, you'll see on the bottom left, there's a confidence slider that would allow you to adjust you know, the probability uh, uh, that you were willing to tolerate of those error bars being right. And then up above, you could speed up and slow down the different groups. If you decided you were more interested in resolving group K, which had high variance, you could tell the system to do that by sort of speeding it up. Um, here's another, this probably doesn't show, oh, maybe it does. Um, so this is an example that actually Chris Olsten did. Chris went on to fame uh, as a professor at CMU, as the author of Pig at Yahoo, but he worked with uh, me as an undergrad at Berkeley on data visualization. And what he was doing was just plotting randomly selected points from, in this case, uh, this is the scatter plot, and it happens to be place names in the United States. And as it ran, it sort of looked like this. 
And that's kind of nice, halfway through, you can tell that it's the United States just based on the distribution, but uh, you don't really know what the eventual densities are gonna be. Um, and so what we did is we overlaid, the reason this is called clouds is that we would overlay this display with density plots, and these density plots would refine themselves over time as you would get a decreased variance in one of these colored squares, the square would split itself into four as a quad tree and give you more detailed coloring. And this thing would, as you watch it, would kind of sizzle and the clouds would sort of lift and eventually you'd be left with just the data. And so you'd start out right from the beginning seeing a, a pretty good approximation of what was to come. It looked very much like an image loading over a slow modem. Um, the most interesting, perhaps, and most useful tool we built, except that it had the world's worst user interface, was this thing called Potter's Wheel, which was a tool for uh, data cleaning and, uh, and data analysis. And it was sort of a spreadsheet metaphor for looking at very large data sets. So data would stream into this thing. And uh, as it was streaming in, you could manipulate it as if it were just a plain old spreadsheet. And then you could pull down these menus, which is a really awkward interface, but to manipulate the data via an algebra of, of uh, operations. And Potter's wheel is a piece of research that was quite intriguing at the time. We put it on the shelf for about a decade, and then when I started working with Jeff, uh, we, we uh, looked at this work again and built a tool called Data Wrangler that's been uh, quite popular in recent years and has a much more uh, powerful and pleasant experience for the user. So that was 2001, and uh, you know a lot of work had been going on at that time in my group on interaction with data on some of the things that Jeff was talking about. And then, of course, you, knew, you know what happened next. In, in the early 2000s, this happened, right? Suddenly batch processing was all the rage. So MapReduce paper came out in about 2004. A bunch of us went and worked on streaming systems, but MapReduce came out in 2004. And for about five years, maybe, maybe seven years, everybody was perfectly happy with no interaction with their systems at all. It was a giant step into the past of user interfaces back to batch processing. Um, but the good news is that that's uh, been getting better over time. There's a, a whole set of research from my group and from people at Rice and Microsoft. And most recently, uh, the Microsoft guys have a system called STAT, and my colleagues at Berkeley have a system called BlinkDB that's trying to revive this idea of incremental uh, results from long-running computations over data. And I definitely encourage folks to look at this. So interaction is slowly making its way back into the mindset of data analysts as they're hitting pragmatics. So that's nice. All right, so I want to go back to Jeff's uh, uh, pipeline here. You know, really where this work sat was just in the very middle there of visualization around uh, analytics uh, and to some degree with Potter's Wheel, the cleaning and integration piece as well. All right, uh, so Jeff and I, though, a couple years ago decided that we would try to figure out with our colleague and, and joint student, Sean Kandel, what analysts really thought. Because again, this is just research that I was showing you. This is stuff we made up at Berkeley, more or less. Um, and so to do this, we set Sean off. He did all the work here, but he, inter he interviewed 35 analysts uh, across about 25 companies. And these were people who had a variety of titles. Uh, some of them were uh, more management. Some of them were hands on the keyboard. And we wrote a paper about this work, which I encourage you to have a look at. The paper goes through and, and categorizes in many ways uh, uh, the results of this informal survey. Um, and I won't go through this matrix for you today, but what I will do is show you just a couple quotes from real analysts working with real data. So the first quote comes from a person who works at an internet advertising firm. He says, I spend more than half my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis most of the time. I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And this speaks to the fact that just there's enormous lost productivity in, in the space of data analytics and big data. People are spending most of their time doing stuff they don't even view as their job. Right? And that's the, the, the bane of everyone's existence right now. The second thing he said right after that, though, it's quite interesting. He said, most of the time, once you transform the data, the insights can be scarily obvious. And he went on to talk about how a simple mean is often all he really needed after he's got the data ready to go. Right? And of course, that's a sort of 80-20 thing. 20% of the time, you need to do something quite sophisticated. But a lot of the time, you just need to get eyeballs on data. And this speaks to the fact that there's uh, uh, an ability for a large number of people to do data analysis 80% of the time, they just don't have access to the data. They somehow can't get the data into a form where they could do that Excel spreadsheet and look at the mean. Okay, so um, that was pretty interesting. The other piece of feedback we got from an analyst at LinkedIn was the following. Uh, it's easy to just think you know what you're doing and not look at data at every intermediary step. And analysis has 30 different steps. It's tempting to just do this, then that, and then this. You have no idea in which ways you're wrong and what data is wrong. And this just goes back once again to the theme that Jeff and I both have been harping on, which is analytics without getting eyeballs on data, without rapid iteration, is an incredibly conservative process and an incredibly frustrating process. You can't do much 
If you're gonna run a job that's gonna take 10 minutes, you're gonna forget what you were thinking about. It is not in the flow of creative thought. All right, and so people do fairly simple things. They run the algorithm, they look at the outputs, they go, huh. And maybe they run a report every week, but it's really hard to do true data exploration without interactivity. And so this company that Jeff and I are, are building uh, with Sean, it's called Trifacta, it's really focusing on this theme of people, data, and computation, trying to look at very large data sets, trying to look at the computational tools we have to work with data, but to do those things in service of the people who are doing the work, and really look very simply at the basic frustrations of their day, uh, and try to allow them to be the analysts that they can be. So two themes, one is analytic productivity for data scientists, remove that drudgery from the task, and give them back their time to do their creative work. And secondly, for folks who maybe aren't as technical as the people in this room and couldn't have run Carlos's demo even uh, with cut and paste, um, they should actually oftentimes be able to do self-service work. They should be able, at minimum, to get the data in a form where they can do a histogram and they can do some breakdown reports and see what's going on. And that's just so terribly hard right now in most cases. Um, and you know, going back to 1998 or whenever these slides were, you know, my theme really hasn't changed that much, although the priorities maybe have. All right, and that helps from uh, hanging out with Jeff. Um, before I close, I just want to give you a sense of where this all fits together. Um, and to do that, I have just a little chart. Uh, this is the landscape I was working in in sort of the 90s. On the x-axis, we have how cooked is your data. On the y-axis, we sort of have how high you sit in the skyscraper at a company. Okay, so in the basement is the IT staff and the quants are sort of in the middle and the decision makers at the top. And this is your traditional uh, data analysis pipeline in a, in a 90s era IT shop. Data comes in through IT, it gets loaded by an ETL process into a database. Eventually it makes its way up into stat packages, BI tools, and spreadsheets. Everything ends up in Excel eventually. Okay. Um, and this is fine, you know, this is still going on today at most major uh, enterprises, corporations, science, uh, and so on. But really what's changed is that there's, there's uh, new tools, so there's all this stuff around HDFS and Hadoop and, and all those good things, and then their data is just so damn available now. So you have data within your own line of business, LOB, right? You have, uh, if you're a scientist, you have your own data. If you're a marketing person, you have your own data. If you're a uh, uh, person working in manufacturing, you probably have data from your own devices that don't go through IT. And you can get data for purchase, you can get data from partners, you can get data for free. Everybody can get data, and everybody can get a modest amount of compute to stick that data in and run it. Uh, but not everybody can get the data from the left-hand side of this picture to the right. They can load it into something like a filer, an HDFS, and then they just get stuck because they don't have the skills to bring it across, or it's too time-consuming to bring it across. And that's kind of the goal of our, of our effort at Trifacta, is to, is to, to smooth that process, uh, to use the technologies that we've been developing uh, in, research, in research, the hard stuff, to make things easy for users. And so that's really the focus of uh, the company, and, and I hope the talk also gave you a sense of where our heads are uh, on this stuff with both research and practice. Thanks.